Hello everyone and welcome to the new lecture of motion control systems. I want to start with uh, an apologize actually. Uh, I was trying to record the video uh, at the weekend but there were serious problems in my network so I couldn't solve them. It was only yesterday that you know I could fix the fix the problem so I, I can start the, the recording. Now today's topic will be about the motion control systems with time delay. Let's write it. Systems with time delay. And we will be talking about how we can control the systems when there is time delay between the measurement and uh, through the control channels. Uh, there might be several reasons to, to go through this. You might easily ask that, you know, where would we actually need such, such control systems? With the development of internet medium and with the, the uh, widespread usage of uh, internet of things, we will be, we will now, uh, actually we are now able to, to play with systems that are uh, through to be controlled through network environment and this requires us to know how we can control the motion con motion through a time play several applications can be listed I just tried to formulate some so let me write some applications could be remote teleoperation that is teleoperation through a long distance uh, geographically separated system or another example could be long distance navigation Suppose you're trying to, to control a robot through a network that is far away from you and you're using some, some wireless communication medium like 5G. Or there could be another application like satellite control. There, there may be so many applications that would require you to control the system through a network medium so we should learn how to how to control the system through network but there's a problem when we're talking about network let's write it here problem which is the time delay Let's write it here. Long distance operation brings the time delay effects. So let us think of a scenario. Suppose you're trying to control a robot that is just 500 kilometers away from the, the, the city uh, you're residing. So if you just think of the time delay due to the, the speed of light, it will have, it will require actually a couple of milliseconds for the signals that you give here to reach to remote location. And even if there is no additional delay, because of the, the, the network environment, any latency because of the network, there is still some time delay due to the uh, limit, limited speed of the light between those two nodes. So maybe it's, it's, going to, it's going to be a good starting point to compare, let's write it, compare 
two architectures where there is time delay and there is no time delay. Comparison of control architectures. So, in the classical control, uh, in the classical motion control, we have some position reference to go, which goes through a controller. Let's write it here, controller. And your controller sends control current IC of T to the plant let's write here plant plus disturbance observer and your plant sends back its measured responses such as position or velocity right now that is the that's actually classical control architecture let's try let's try to take it inside the window this one is the classical control architecture and what we have when there is time delay is something like this you still have the same reference to go xref of t which goes through the controller but now your controller should contain somehow an observer to estimate the remote system variables because signals are passed between those two systems with time delays what I mean is this the control current is here I C of T but because of the time delay between my controller and the, the, the system to be controlled that is called in, that's called a delay in control channel we can only send our control input I C with a time delay in control channel that is IC of T minus DC and this also goes to the remote plant we can also assume that the remote plant has its own disturbance observer which means that it can it can carry out acceleration control and it can follow the the commanded current signal so, at the feedback side, we have either x of t or x dot of t, which goes through another delay, that is the uh, delay in measurement, and you can only receive on the controller side the delayed signal that's x of t minus dm and x dot of t minus dm so that's the second architecture and it's what happens when you have time delay in your control action or in, in your control loop let us try to close the box and okay this is the second one now when you move from a classical control architecture to a motion control system with time play you have to take into account throughout the duration of the controller and observer structure you have to take into account that the measurement is subject to some measurement delay which is seriously important when you are trying to control a system in a stable manner so our goal here is to provide stable operation or with, you know instead of operation we can we can write basically 
position tracking, stable position tracking. Under the existence of time delay. Okay, this is our goal. Now, we can start the derivation of our controller. As we were always doing in the in the previous applications, here again, we're gonna drive the, the we're gonna make the derivations for a system that is only one degrees of freedom, but uh, you know for a general general robotic system, it's easy to generalize this theory for multi degrees of freedom applications. So let's write it here. Derivations will be made. For a system with one degree of freedom, and we will have several assumptions before we start our our derivation. Let's start with the first one: assumption. Uh, we will assume that the remote plant can measure the position and velocity responses the position and let's write it long the position and velocity responses but the controller side receives it after a time delay but the controller side receives those measurements after a time delay And once again, our goal is to provide tracking under these conditions. So, the, the assumption can be given here, actually, with, with numerical values. Uh, measurements are x of t minus delay in the measurement channel and x dot of t i'm sorry here it's going to be t minus delay in measurement channel please take a note here that the, the measurements that subject to those delays are crucial for the controller and it's very well known that a controller that that receives uh, signals with time delay would not be able to control the system's output in a stable manner. Just imagine the scenario that your output is at some point and you don't know yet this point, but you only have the measurement at this instant and you're trying to give the control action based on the response at this instant. So this can easily destabilize your system. First, we have to keep that in mind. And second, I, I would like to talk about the magnitude of that DM the measurement mag uh, channel delay, I mean, if you're talking about the measurement channel delay or uh, a forward, which is the control channel delay, uh, like what we have here, delay in control, delay in measurement, possibly none of these are uh, much bigger than one or two seconds. So we're talking actually about some magnitudes that are, that are comparable to milliseconds like 100 milliseconds, 200, 300 milliseconds, but we're not talking about delay that's that's up to, you know, minutes of, of signal transmission. So, with these algorithms, it's really hard to control a robot that's sitting in Mars.
let's move further if we move further we can assume that the remote system has proper disturbance observers and let's let's write this as the second assumption let me write here assumption one and another assumption here is that the remote plant don't forget that we sometimes call that remote plant as the slave plant if we're talking about any application that's in the context of teleoperation systems the remote plant uh, has proper disturbance observers so let me write has proper disturbance compensation via disturbance observers so uh, it's not too difficult to claim that disturbance observer algorithm can be coded on a chip or on the on the local controller that's responsible for the the estimation of the disturbances in the remote plant and we can assume that it is robust it's acceleration controllable so under these assumptions one can write down the following identity let's start derivation okay you have the tau this network now this is very that's not anything familiar to you that's very new pretty new and i'm going to explain it in a couple of minutes that's equal to k nominal times i c of t by the way i have to also write this as a function of time that's tau network disturbance so this network of time t should be equal to this minus nominal mass times the acceleration response of the remote plant at t minus dm this part is crucially important well remember in remember in our derivation uh, for the disturbance observer algorithm we had the given input minus the measurement right and we were told we were talking about the fact that these i mean the difference between the given input and the response corresponds to the disturbance torque here again we have the notion of disturbance torque but now we call it the network disturbance why do we call it the network disturbance because it's simply something like that you have here the plant plus the disturbance observer you have here the the controller and your controller is giving some measurement IC of T and it's receiving the the response let's assume that it's receiving the acceleration response from the remote system X double dot of T minus DM and whatever happens on this side can be called so if, if these two are not matching with one another right so k nominal times i c of t this is the given input and m nominal times uh, x double dot of t minus dm this is the perceived output any difference between those two should correspond to disturbance but this is actually network disturbance okay so here besides this side you have the effect of network okay so we have defined I mean based on these we can define the the concept of network disturbance all right why do we call this term network disturbance because it corresponds to the disturbance acting on the system through the time delay which is a result of the ne network and uh, as usual as always we can estimate so we can estimate 
total disturbance on network via disturbance observer so just take the same disturbance observer we have been implementing in classical motion control architectures give the commanded car current control current to your disturbance observer and give the the delayed measurement to your disturbance observer what you're gonna have is something like this so here you have I C of T that's multiplied by Kn actually it's multiplied by Kn inside the disturbance observer so this is your DOB and here what you have is the velocity response of the remote system that is x dot of t minus dm and the output will be tau disturbance network hat of course disturbance observer can only give an estimate estimation of the uh, disturbance acting in this acting to the system so this was the key equation I, uh, maybe it's it's better if I take it inside a box like this all right now let's write here that the, the network disturbance stands for the disturbance let's write here stands for the disturbance acting on the system on the remote system of course throughout the time delay the time delay so if we have a chance to estimate the disturbance like a disturb you know like using a disturbance observer then it should be too difficult to estimate what happens to our velocity during the delay time if I write a formula like this what would you think how about this if I claim that there is Delta X dot of T which is equal to nothing but the integral of 1 over nominal mass of the remote system times the network disturbance estimated network disturbance and its integral actually okay so here we have we have to look at this equation very carefully because this is a very crucial information for the rest of our algorithms what I'm claiming here is that this is the network disturbance acting on my system and if you look at the previous figure that disturbance is basically telling me what's gonna happen or what kind of torques should be acting on my system throughout the time delay so if I have its estimation here then I can divide this by nominal mass which will give me the difference in acceleration during the time delay and if I integrate it I'll basically get the difference in velocity during the time delay so here delta x dot of t stands for the for the change of measured velocity during time delay
Why can we claim this? Because this estimated disturbance only stands for the change of the torque, disturbance torque, or, or torque acting on my system during the time delay. And it's easy to claim that if I divide this by Mn here and integrate it, I'll basically get some velocity. And this velocity is actually how I denote as delta x dot. And it stands for the change of the measured velocity during the time delay. Now, it's not too difficult from this point to claim that uh, this is actually predicted change of uh, velocity during time delay. It's right here, i.e. predicted or estimated change in measured velocity after time delay. So, with this information in hand, I can move one step ahead and claim here that, so, with delta x dot of t and x dot of t minus dm, we can obtain uh, we can obtain an estimation of x dot of t as follows. Since this is what we have, so since x dot of t minus dm is what we have as the measured uh, response from the remote system. And since we're claiming that delta x dot of t is the change of velocity during the time delay, can we claim here that the estimation of remote system's uh, velocity at time t can be given as a summation of those two? I think this claim can be naturally understood or it's easily grasped when we investigate in detail the, the uh, structure given here. Not here, here actually. So, we can write here several notes. If we assume that there is no noise in the system, if the this, this signals, that's the measured signal here, and the estimated response from the disturbance signal are all clear signals, we can claim that there wouldn't be any noise. And since there wouldn't be any noise, there wouldn't be any integration errors first. Second, we are not sure about the estimations, initial condition, and actual response initial condition. So we can write here those notes under, under the assumption that the initial conditions are zero are zero and the signals are not noisy The predicted measurement Sorry about those lines. I have a problem with the with the tablet I'm using. The predicted measurement max with the actual measurement.
So this is item number one. But this is an ideal condition that the initial conditions will be exactly equal to one another and there will not be any noise in the system. These are too much idealization that's uh, impossible to, to encounter with in a real-time system. So we can write here, however, uh, such ideal conditions do not exist so we need additional compensation which means that we need additional compensation for actually to provide x dot hat of t is equal to x dot of t okay now as we always do when we remember talking about additional compensation we have nothing but the control action in our system so without loss of generality loss of generality uh, one can write one can write the following estimation error That is error in estimation is nothing but C1 times X of T minus X hat of T plus C2 times X dot of T minus X dot hat of T. So we're trying to formulate additional compensation which would take this error which is the error between estimated position and the actual position and the estimated velocity and the actual velocity so we have in a sense a generalized error of uh, between the estimation and the actual variables and we're trying to move this error to zero value so Forcing E X hat to exponential convergence to zero value would be possible with e x hat dot plus I can write here k x hat e x hat is equal to zero this is actually what we were doing in our uh, generalized error control applications we were defining the error as a linear combination of the position and velocity and we were trying to enforce such a dynamic that will take our error to uh, for, from any initial value and move it to zero value as time goes on so if you basically take this error here and substitute it here what you will get is something like this uh, let me write it here which uh, yields to We have a very long and complicated equation. I'm trying to write it here. So you have C2 X double dot of T 
plus kx c2 plus c1 times x dot of t plus kx c1 x of t minus the same identity c2 x double dot hat of t plus kx c2 plus c1 x dot hat of t plus kx c1 x hat of t should all be equal to zero the first item minus the second item so this actually comes when you take that error here and substitute it here and expand the equation so now there are some points to to pay attention here you know in, in the classical control architectures we were having some some references and responses and we were claiming that all reference values reference position reference velocity reference acceleration are known because it's it's us the the user who is giving the uh the reference to our controller but here we have something else we have accelerations of the actual response and the estimated response velocities of the actual and estimated response and positions of the actual and estimated response the only way to provide this equation minus this equation b equal to zero seems to be having independently this equation being equal to zero and the second equation being equal to zero so the previous equation can be satisfied if we have basically c2 x double dot of t plus kx c2 plus c1 times x dot of t plus kx c1 x of t is equal to zero that's the first condition and second condition will be c2 x double dot hat of t plus kx c2 plus c1 times x dot hat of t plus kx c1 x hat of t is equal to zero now uh, if we provide that both of these equations are zero then we can come up with so solution of these two equations will give us the convergence uh convergence accelerations as follows so x x double dot convergence of time t is equal to minus I can write it actually here minus k x c2 plus c1 over c2 x dot of t minus k x c1 over c2 x of t so that's the convergence acceleration on the actual actual plant actual remote plant and we can write here x double dot hat of convergence which is equal to minus 
kx c2 plus c1 over c2 times x dot head of t minus kx c1 over c2 x head of t All right so from these two accelerations we can generate the convergence current can be found or let me write can be acquired as I convergence of T is nothing but minus KD times X dot of T minus KP times X of T. So we basically have a PD convergence, PD additional convergence term required by the system. minus kd x dot hat of t minus kp x hat of t so if we if we further add these two currents one to the estimated side and one to the remote side the first one being added to the remote side and the second one being added to the estimated side then we can provide that the error between the actual system response and the estimated response is taken to zero value as time goes to infinity. So maybe we can write here the values, KP, KD values, let's write it here, where KD is M nominal kx c2 plus c1 over k nominal c2 so that's that's one of the parameters we have and kp will then be m nominal times kx c1 over K nominal times C2. These are nothing but the gains given here and here just multiplied by Mn over Kn so that you have currents from the accelerations. Well, we have to take some notes now. With the convergence currents, so when we add these two convergence currents to our system, the predicted and the actual measurements are synchronized. Let's Let's write it here so that you have the note. With the convergence currents, the predicted and the actual measurements are now synchronized that's one the only remaining part let's write here now the only remaining part is to construct a controller a controller to generate the control current
which may then be sent so which may then be sent to the remote system I'm gonna write here that this is actually the slave system after a control channel delay after a control channel delay of DC actually what we're talking about here is that architecture now we had position of the remote plant and the velocity of the remote plant taken after a time delay and by adding a disturbance observer here and by giving our input current and the measured response to this disturbance observer we estimated the disturbance in the network and we integrated this disturbance actually divided it by mn and integrated to get the the delta x term and that delta x term is supposed to be the velocity change during the time delay dm and we have then formulated that if we add convergence term to here and here additional convergences to our plants then our estimation would be following the actual response and with the estimation being equal to the actual response now we can design our controller generate our current and of course once we send our current it's going to go to the remote plant after a time delay that's what i was trying to write with those notes okay we can write here that assuming available uh, reference position and velocity and velocity comments one can apply another PD controller and which yields to the following control current so our control current can then be given as IC of T is nothing but K proportional control this is different than the, the KD KP values here because these are for convergence that's only for control x ref of t minus x hat ref of t plus k d convergence times x dot ref of t minus x dot hat i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry this shouldn't be referenced there's no reference there okay this is x of x hat of t basically plus k d control times x reference dot of t minus x estimated dot of t so that current can be sent to the remote plant to provide uh, to provide tracking of the references given here well i have i think this would uh, give a full stop to my discussion for the uh, motion control systems with time delay uh, along with those slides i'll be providing you a block diagram 
that's as a as a uh, picture attached to the material of the the weekly lecture content and i'll try to give you some graphical responses i'll try to show the the responses on graphs uh, or I, maybe i can i can give a paper for those of you who are in interested and i'll try to upload a video where you can see the motions of two systems following one another after the time delay in a precise manner these are only for for experimental purposes now i'd like to uh, draw your attention to one last point that we have only one lecture uh, remaining in in the uh, following days actually this friday is i think the last day of the classes uh, i will try to make up uh, make a a wrap-up lecture but not go through the the existing material because you already have the videos and you can watch them and you can have a look at the lecture notes once more to to recover whatever missing uh, point you have in mind but i'll rather than this uh, try to show you illustration details i have installed the matlab uh, licensed matlab server on my uh, system on my computer so I'll try to either show uh, how to write a control algorithm in MATLAB M file and how to create a simulink block diagram so that you can use either one of the simulink or MATLAB to create your, your simulations for the uh, midterm exam and final exam and that, that's actually what you would need. And Rather than simulink, I will put more emphasis on the coding part in MATLAB M file because there you can directly see. Okay, simulink is is is. Let me let me state once more. Simulink is a block diagram where you can see you can follow the signal uh, signals from one block to another. So it shows you the signal pattern, signal uh, flowchart. It's easy to grasp from that visualization what happens uh, but for MATLAB M file it's not that easy but in MATLAB M file you're gonna see that whatever you code can easily be converted to other software medium like Octave or or if you want to run your simulation in C environment then definitely you would need a written algorithm of your, your of your a written code of your algorithms actually so that's what we're gonna try to do in the last lecture and that's what I already promised you that I'm gonna make some recovery lectures uh, for the for the uh, practical applications side because I know that you're all asking about this well that's all for today thanks for watching and take care guys